nerve wracking. <laughs> I'm actually shaking. As I say, it's usually him shaking when he's playing me pool. Um, as I say, I was always going to do this. I said, no, my grandmother passed yesterday, but she would have wanted me up here doing this. So that's one of the reasons I'm standing here tonight. And thank you all for the turnout and everybody coming out to hear my story. Uh, I'm just going to start. Before I even get down, I was thinking to myself, should I wear a shirt and tie and should I wear a suit? But that's just not me. And Boneyard said to me the very first time when I asked him about coming to church, uh, he said, tell me, come as you are. Amen. And I was thinking about coming down, even coming down here, me, should I have put a shirt and tie or something on tonight? But you don't need a suit to do business with God. Amen. Amen. So, introduction, uh, my name's Stephen Paul. Most people probably don't even know me by that name. It's probably B.A. you know me by. I'll just go through the story of how I got the name of B.A. first. Came back when I lived in Sugarfield Street. Everybody remember the A-team? Well, there was me and three other friends, Drew Cole, John Cole, and Chris Young. And we all had a character each from the A-team. So obviously I was B.A. And the funny thing about it is, this one was when we were really young, maybe five, six, and going on, going into sort of finishing primary school, going into secondary school, I was still getting called BA. Nobody else was getting called Maud Murdoch, <laughs> Face, Hannibal. <laughs> so that's how the name sort of stuck. But the, the funny thing about it is, why I'm standing here tonight, when I think of my name now, if you think of BA, Born again. Amen. So that, that's, what, that's what I'm using that from now on. That's the last you're going to hear the A-team story. <laughs> so I was born in 1973 at the city hospital. And just as I go through, just to let you all be aware, my testimony isn't about me. It's about God. I'm the one telling the story. Uh, my first ever home, my mom had to tell me this because I don't remember. I was only six months old. was up in Glen Cairn, Fourth River Link, where we lived there for six months before we moved to Sugarfield Street. That was our very first house my mom said they'd bought. Um, Sugarfield Street was where I spent the early years of my childhood uh, growing up. And I, I used to love the sort of community we had down there. All the moms and all out the door. I would have played football the all hours in the street. And you could have run in and out everybody's houses, except for Boneyard. <laughs> <laughs> As I said, I, I remember... There was Sugarfield Street, Haddo Street, and Bellevue Street, and I, I still don't remember this, and I was, I'm trying to think about it all week, because um, I know I went to the wee mission hall at the bottom of Bellevue Street, and the Baptist Church on Tennant Street, but one day every Sunday, it was the mission hall on a Sunday morning, and then the bus would have come around, it was a Baptist Church, three o'clock, away to church and I used to love going uh, and it joined the BB, the Church of God. Um, but the thing about Sugarfield Street and growing up and the great people that lived there was uh, the street parties and all we used to have. We were all out painting the curbs red, white and blue and <coughs> I've got a wee drink here. As I say, growing up, I loved it. I loved where we were living down there. And as I say, it was the early part of the Troubles when I mean, the Troubles just started. And we, on Sugarfield Street at the bottom where we lived, you were right beside the Peace Wall. And it's not the way it is now. There actually used to be this bit directly faced the bottom of Sugarfield Street where it was like the big concrete bollards. 
with like big steel poles and corrugated iron on them. There was one at the front on our side and the other side, there was one. But there was gaps in them at the bottom of the corrugated iron been pulled out and we used to get through and go up the top of the street and run down and put all the windows in <laughs> and get back out again. So we were all round at the back of Haddle Street one day and I see these two guys coming down from the bottom of Longbrook Avenue down. But the cab shouting, did you see a wee dog? And I says, no, mister. And they walked further, started getting closer to us. And he shouted again, you didn't see a wee dog? No, so he got right up close to me. He hit me a dig in the back. <laughs> he says, see the next time you go in there and break those windows, I'm gonna break your jaw. And the two of them start, by the time I run round to try and get somebody, the two of them are away, run their ratty. So you can take it, I never threw stones or went through that corrugated iron again. Uh, we moved to, mom and dad moved to Malvern Way, 1981, I was about, I think I was about eight, eight years old when we moved. Uh, it was a bigger house, they just started doing the Shankill Estate then and we get down, uh, me and my brother, mom and dad, and uh, it was a three bedroom house, so we were able to get a room each. And back and front garden, it was brilliant. But that didn't last long, within seven years, there were six of us. <laughs> one sister, so the other five were all stuck in the one room. <laughs> As I say, and I always, between Malvern Way, another great place growing up and I'll always say this is probably two of the best streets and some of the friends I still have today from running about there and some of them's here the night Lineker, Pigeon and I can't see by a slide who else is in but say made some great friends over the years and still friends to the day but because there were so many of us in the house so we used to stay back and forward from my granny Aggie's house, uh, back in Sugarfield Streets, but I still had friends from growing up, so we were always back and forward uh, from staying. But one of the things I remember about, you never got away on a foreign holiday. The, the holiday we got away on was Blackpool every year in September. And I'm, everybody that went away, there was a few kids, but all the other ones was all the old folk took you around, ballroom dancing, <laughs> round the bus, watch the illuminations. What sort of trip's that for any child to go away on? But we used to love it, but there was this one time, my, my granny and Carl and all that got the brochure for Blackpool and says, look, here's a new place here, it's only opened. We'll go and stay there. And it looked fantastic. So when we actually got there, we thought we were in the wrong, we were staying in the wrong place. It was, a, it was a dundering in. It didn't look anything like it didn't look anything like the photos. And we found out in the end that the two guys that owned this place were only out of prison. <laughs> so they must have got somebody to do the photos up for them. Uh, as I say, so you can imagine what was in it. So first, first, first night there, get up the next morning to get her breakfast. There wasn't enough bowls. <laughs> so my granny came in with my breakfast and a pool you go to the toilet in. <laughs> and <laughs> I started crying and everything. I just wanted to go home. <laughs> and my granny, my granny had a wee shop at the top of, Cam the top of Camor Street. I think everybody remembers it because if you lived in the shankle around the end days, if you walked down the shankle, half of it was wearing duffel coats, snorkels, shell suits. <laughs> and it says, you were up in Aggie's shop. <laughs> and the, the, the thing about my granny's shop, well, it wasn't a shop like any other shop. You go in, you buy something, because they all sat in it all day. Even Boneyard used to come in and top her for a fiver for a bat. And she still chased them for it. <laughs> well, that and I. 
as I say, it was a great place, great, a great, a great atmosphere and all. I loved my time growing up, but sort of getting to, it was 10 or 11, and still back and forward, as I say, from Malvern Way to Sugarfield Street, getting into secondary school, and Herbie McCollum, now they were all a, bit, a wee bit older than us, Herbie McCollum went and got a tattoo. I think it was Julian was doing them in the old park. So he came back and he's over showing us the tattoo and all. And we're, hey, he's loving me. I want a tattoo. Here's me. But if I go and ask my mommy and daddy, they won't let me. So I went and said to my granny. And she says, I'll take you. <laughs> so away we went up the old park. Gets into the tattoo. And I says, I don't know where I can get this. Go stick them needles in my arm. And she turned around and says, I'll get one first. <laughs> so I says, well, what are you going to get? Here she says, I'll get the UDA badge. <laughs> so my granny got a UDA badge on her arm before I got my tattoo. Uh, and, she, and she still had it right, never got it covered. She still had the UDA, but the only tattoo she ever had was UDA badge. <laughs> I got the sort of getting on a wee bit just till about 1989 and uh, I started dating Joanne at, the, at that point. I was about fifth year in school, about 15 or 16. And I know she always fancied me and chased me and things like that, but... Because I remember when we were a wee bit younger, we went to the zoo and all together, but, and she, she always had a thing for me, but I was just wasn't wearing it. <laughs> so I started, started dating Joanne, and we're actually 25 years married this year, uh, 14th of June. <laughs> and we've been together for 33. So, from childhood right through to now. Now, the thing about my dad, he was a mad Liverpool supporter. He just loved Liverpool. So, he tried with me, no, Man United. Tried with Gary, no, Man United. Tried with Darn, no, Man United. Then Ran, Ran didn't like football. So, Jason was the last one born, and so he went out and bought all this. I don't mean when he was young, when he started to get into a bit of football and stuff, when he understood who he wanted to support and stuff. So my dad went out and bought all this Liverpool stuff for him, and Jason ended up supporting Chelsea. <laughs> so he had to go in next door and go with the wee lad next door, because he's the only one supporting Liverpool. As I say, growing up, I always liked to be involved in things, and some of the younger, like the Linegar, know when they were young, they were a few years younger than me, always got involved in like the volunteering at the summer scheme and stuff. Uh, after schools through Bernardo's and stuff. The thing about after schools was the kids were bringing these homeworks in I couldn't do. <laughs> um, then, just moving on about a wee bit here. Um, my daughter Stephanie was born in 1992, so it was an opportunity for me to get out of that bedroom we were sharing with the other, the other brothers, so we got our first house down 37 Boundary Way, down Lower Shankle. Then 1993, a bit of a tragedy sort of hit the family. Brother Ram was away, it was the last, last trip away with a summer scheme, the way the last trip, they, they hire the big coaches and stuff out, usually went to Port Rice or something like that. Um, Ram was only nine years old at the time, so on the way back, they stopped on the 
like a carriageway, they say, the carriageway, but we're stopping to let ones off to go to the toilet. And where, where he stopped, in this side of the carriageway, they had the cross to get to the other side. So kids being kids at that age, they opened the bus doors, the kids run out, ran, run out in front of the bus. He got hit by a car, come down, caught onto the trailer and took away down the road. And really, really bad injuries. Now, I wasn't away on that trip, but we were at the bottom of the street and I'd seen uh, two police, two police officers going to the house. And I, ru I run up the street. I didn't know what was going on. And I just seen my mum screaming and my dad was chalk white. Uh, it wasn't good, the news wasn't good. He had all sorts of injuries with his brain, all bones broke, his legs, arms, everything. And uh, two nurses were coming along from a, they were coming back from a wedding. And they got out and he'd actually died at the, the scene. And they actually started working with him and got him around. At that time, the almonds came. Uh, they were able to get him to the nearest hospital. But his injuries were so bad, they needed to move him to the Royal. Um, were on the way there, they had to resuscitate him again. He had emergency surgery on his brain and all the bones that were broken in his body. But... Uh, he'd been in a coma, he went into a coma and he was in it for a long time but probably the, the thing that will always get you about this here, about him being in there, not knowing if he would survive or what kind of injuries he's gonna, he's gonna have. I think the, the only thing out of it, obviously the way he is now was my mum put the we headset on them where you get the wee uh, deck you play music on and probably the worst ones you could have picked, Dolly Parton. <laughs> Constantly playing Dolly Parton, oh, I will always love you and all this here. So when Ran came out of the coma, when, when he came round, uh, my mum's uncle used to go down and pray with him while he was in the coma, Eddie McGill, some of you should probably know Eddie, that's my mum's uncle. And Eddie used to go down and pray with him. So eventually he came out of the coma. But Ran, when he came out of it, couldn't, rem couldn't remember a single thing about his life. He couldn't remember who he was. He couldn't remember what happened. He couldn't remember his life before that. And he actually thought my mom was the nurse. He didn't even know her as his mother. So it was hard to take. He didn't know any of us. And... It was really hard to take and understand, especially us being so young when it happened. As, as I say, so when through time, I fancy he was getting out of hospital, he was in a wheelchair, obviously with all the broken bones and stuff and the head injuries. But he thought my mom was a nurse and she had took him home to her family. And this, this, this went on for a long time. And to be fair, my mom just dug her heels in and tried to give him the best life she could for the... For the <laughs> she tried to give him the best life she could for the injuries he had. But just a bit, but I forgot to mention her. Uh, at the early stages of that, when he had that accident, they were actually, they were that bad, the injuries and stuff, that they wanted to turn the life support off. And my mum refused and st stuck it out. So to me, we had a down praying for him and stuff. That was God working. Amen. Amen. So after that, there, uh, sort of getting out of hospital and all, a couple of years later, uh, my dad was involved with drugs. And they got a threat and they had to get out, they had to get out of the house they lived in. And they ended up, they moved to Bangor. And I 
me and Gary, the next one down to me, we stayed because we, we weren't living at home at the time. So my mom and the other four went down to Bangor to live. Uh, I just, I've actually missed a wee bit here, I just one minute. It's actually a good wee story, but I'll pick up on this bit here. Um, while we were living in the Malvern Way, none of remember this, Andy Collins and all, they always had our bonfire just behind the courthouse. They always had our bonfire just behind the courthouse. And we all, they all stayed, they all went into my, when we were too tired or whatever, or too cold, but they went into our living room and all laid in the settees on the floor and all, and went asleep. But one, one night we'd done this, we come out in our wood was we. And well, here we were, that same Hope Wellers. <laughs> so Andy says, get your ma. <laughs> so and we went, got my ma up and says, they've took all her wood. So she gets on her. Away we went down to Hope Well, all us trailing behind her. Um, so we gets down, Harvey and all, he's sitting playing the flute down in Hope Well, load the other ones. Used, used, my mom says, you took their wood and their pallets. Says, no, we didn't. How do you know? And we, and we were just pointing to pallets. That's ours. That's ours. They're, they all just looked the same. But we were saying they were ours. And my, my mom says, um, will you make, get them back up there? Because that's their wood. And one of them shouted, I get Mary Douglas for you. And my mom shouted, well, I'm going up to get Wazzy for you. And here he was. Right, we'll help you bring it back up. <laughs> so there they were. We were carrying it up. They were carrying them up. And we actually got far more than what we actually had. <laughs> I say, so living in, living in Bangor, my mom and dad had settled down there. And obviously, the, with the injuries ran and stuff had, the housing and stuff put this big extension and stuff on. The the house to accommodate Rand to have his own space and uh, bathroom and stuff. Then there was a, um, a my dad's brother, one of my dad's brothers lived in Beaver at the time. There was a, there was an attempt on his life and uh, my, my, my dad, I want, if anybody knows him, if anybody done anything to his family, he would have came looking you. And eventually, the person was involved in shooting my dad's brother. My dad eventually caught up with him in Bangor. And he'd give him a bad beating. Only for my mom getting him away. I don't know what, what would have happened. But as I say, um, not long after that there, in... 3rd of July, 1998. I'll just go back to this bit here. I'm going to skip bits here, sorry. Um, let's go back to 1997, I say. Uh, me and Joanna got married on the 14th of June, 1997. Then her son Darl was born the following year on the 10th of April, 1998, which was the day the Good Friday Agreement was signed. I think everything was going to be good for the, the country, but the way things were going, obviously the ceasefires and stuff. But, but that was one for routine, and he was... Always first out, first thing in the morning, went to the shop to get his papers, to sit and read in the house. And this morning he came back from getting the papers and there was a gunman waiting and shot him a number of times in the head, which... He died at the scene. Um, the thing, the thing about this that gets me the most is 
I was living in Boundary Way at the time and the phone rang early in the morning. Answered the phone. There was my mum squealing down the phone. Your dad's been shot dead. And that, that, that phone call and it always, and do you ever get something where it's a recording and you can't delete it? Well, that's, that's the way it is for me. I just can't say you can hear it. When it comes back, when I'm, there's always times when I come back and it gets to me. As I say, even after my, even after my dad had been murdered, my mom received a death threat. The day of the funeral, there was a bomb scare, and the funeral had to be redirected. So you can imagine the things we were having to deal with and the stress that the the family were under. As I say, going through the, through the years and say. All right, you're doing stuff in community and everything else, but that wasn't just the way it always was because when I was growing up, even till the uh, late teens, till later life, been out partying, taking drugs, and struggling with my own demons of, of what had happened and, and things that got there after my dad's murder. And... One time we were actually partying and went back, went back to our house uh, and we'd get given this stuff and then when you're taking drugs or everything else, you, you just put stuff in. It doesn't matter if somebody t- tells you this drug here is the best. It's, there's no drug safe. No matter, you're taking the chance for your life every time you take drugs. And we had took this stuff uh, what somebody told us was speed. It wasn't. It was actually stuff for putting horses down. And I, I collapsed the, the floor in the house and got rushed to the hospital. Um, my lung had actually collapsed. And laying in, hos- in the hospital bed, uh, and every time I kept coming around, my mum was with me. Joanne had to stay in the house with the kids. And just kept saying to my mom, I'm Dan, I'm Dan. Uh, tell Joanne the kids I love them. And it was one of the first times that I actually cried out to God to help me. I don't want to die. And I fancy after a, a sort of day of whatever they were doing to get that out of my system, uh, it started, it started coming round, and it actually gave me a real scare. And I, I never, I actually went off drink and anything to get there for about the next seven, eight years. Say, so, and um, under two thousand six, um, our daughter Ricky was born. And when Ricky was, Ricky was born, Jackie, it wasn't long after Ricky was born, Jackie and Jacqueline says, we're going to take Daryl down to the caravan. We're going to take Daryl down to the caravan to give you a wee break. I says, me and Juan had a conversation. Daryl, Daryl was always a handful. As Boneyard would take, Boneyard was his taxi driver taking him to school when he went to Cliftonville. And he used to say to me, I had to sing songs the whole way up <laughs> and the whole way back because he was baiting me over the head with dinosaurs and everything. <laughs> so, Jack and Jacqueline was, would end up with a say, that, yes, that's okay, he can go. They weren't, they weren't, I don't know how long they were away down. And Jackie phoned me, he says, Stephen, you need to get down. <laughs> I says, what's, what's wrong? I, I, and then I thought, hear me, he's weighing me up. He's weighing me up, they're only down. So Daryl and Jackie's son, Nathan, only down there. What did they, they went 
stole two canoes from an ore caravan, <laughs> took the canoes out into the sea, but Doral's had a hole in it. <laughs> there was that, they were that far out, you could hardly see them. Now you're at the mat, Doral was nine years, age, nine years of age at this time. And well, Jackie, Jackie was actually crying when he phoned me because they were that far out, he couldn't get to them. Doral had come out of a canoe at this time and he was in the water for about 15 minutes or so. Would that be right, Jackie? About 15, 20 they, they couldn't get to him, but he was that far out. The canoe was away from him. But Doral kept going under the water. Couldn't swim. He'd never swum in his life. That far out, uh, I think the search and re the, the rescue, you know, the helicopter was up, the boat was out. But he was in the water for a good 15 minutes before, before they came. And when they had the conversation with Dolly when he was young, at that age after it, uh, says, you couldn't swim around. How did, how did you stay up? He says, every time I went under the water, there was somebody grabbing my feet and pushing me back up. And I, so when I'm still talking to Jackie on the phone. I says, where is he now? Where is he now? He's sitting eating the face supper. <laughs> when I just, I'm just going to, a wee verse from the Bible here. Isaiah 43, verse 2 and 3. And this is just relating to that with Daryl. And I believe God had his hands on him that day because there's no way he could not swim at all. And he always carried a wee bit of weight, like myself. And he kept going under that water. And I don't know how anybody, even myself, or even any grown-up, would stay out there for so long if he couldn't swim and stay up in the water. Uh, when you go through deep waters, I will be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. So you're going, I'm sort of going on here to all the build up of things going on and what I was dealing with. And you can go out there. I always loved my football and all. It was escape. And I played and managed at Lower Shankill up at Berlin with Pigeon. I always loved my football. It was escape. It's an escape. And Pigeon would tell you, just to get away from other things. But it's easy to mask your own feelings and what you're going through by doing that. And I was really struggling, but probably more than anybody, Joanne would have seen it because I would have locked myself, even though I went to work and everything else, I would have locked myself away for days on end, sometimes weeks. It started taking panic attacks. The depression started getting worse. Uh, went to the doctors, I'd get medication, I'd been to counselling, and nothing was, nothing was working for me. Nothing was working for me. And one day I actually just sat and everybody was out of the house and I said, I'm just, I'm just going to end it all. I, I, just want, I just want out of this here. I just want to get out of here. I don't want to be going through this anymore. Even though you feel alone, and I don't know many times I say this, but you don't do it. There is people that do care about you. There's people you, you mightn't see your friends for years, but I can guarantee if you pick up the phone and ring them, they'll be round to your door. And a couple of friends I know always picked up on things. Lineker was one of them and Pigeon the other one. And they know what I'm like. I'm dead deep and don't talk about things, but they would always make sure that I'd give you a ring anyway, just to let you know. But this, this time here, it didn't, it didn't occur, I didn't understand why I was feeling this way. And the only thoughts I kept getting was suicide. I just kept thinking, I just need to get out of here. I just need the end of everything. That day, I sitting thinking about the end at all. Heard a voice in my head. 
I just didn't know what it was. I didn't know what it was, but for whatever reason, I decided not to go through with it. I didn't know what the voice was. I didn't know until later. So off that door, I started to get myself back on track and, as I say, started trying to do more things in community and stuff and helping out in the community because I found that was something that always helped me when you were helping other people. I always say you get two hands. God gives you two hands, one to help yourself and one to help others. And someday I, someday I like the Manson because someday I always looked up till even before I got involved in a lot of community stuff was Digger Whiteside. The, the amount of work that the, the man does in the community and stuff and it's fantastic. And I know was someday I said, I want to do something like that. I want to help people in the community. And so that's, I did. And if you, if you all remember back in July 12th, it was the 11th night get into the 12th morning in uh, 2016. Pigeons, is that right? 2016, the bone fires, the, the houses went on fire, the lower shankle. They caught on fire by the sparks of the thing. So me and Pigeon and a few other ones have got together to try and, raise, try and help raise some funds for the, the property and stuff that was destroyed. And uh, I think we raised something around about £18,000. To give, to give out to those families to help them. And then we said to ourselves, well, we can do that during a short space of time. We could do to help other families in the community if things come up. And that's where sort of community first came out of. And you can see the way it goes. It's not, it's not about any individual or any group because well, community first, we just put things out there and it's the community that supports it. It's a community that helps. It's about the community, and it brings community together when they're supporting each other, and that's the, the great thing about it. But another group had set up that same year, and it was actually the, the month after. Uh, Craig Faulkner had taken his own life on the 8th of July, 2016, and then young Johnny Little on the 30th of July, that same month, same year, and we'd all got together and to say that obviously they're part of a football community. Craig played five of sides with us in here every Tuesday and Thursday, just next door. Um, we'd set up the, the SAMI group, Suicide Awareness Mental Health Initiative, and I know what it'd been like to struggle and things they like got there and where I was and stuff, and I just wanted to do something to try and if we could reach anybody that was feeling like that, and I don't mean to say you're going to fix things or it's, it's going to stop people take their lives, but it has saved lives. I know it has saved lives. And I'll just use an example here of, as a young man, 2019 this was, and... I'm just checking for time here. Uh, 2019 this was, and uh, am I okay here? I'm running on a bit. Uh, two, two, two thousand, 2019, my, my car was in, in getting fixed. And the story about that was, why I was in getting fixed, it wasn't anything to do with me. Darrell asked me to get him a gym membership. I got him a gym membership. But he didn't want to walk to the gym when I was at work, so he got in the car. He never drove in his life. Drove the car through the wall. <laughs> I had to get the tow truck to get it lifted off. So the car was in getting fixed, and uh, I had to walk. Uh, no, that, that, day, that day I decided... Uh, to get down the road for something, uh, no car, I wasn't going to phone a taxi, and I always liked walking, so here me, I'll go, I'll go out a walk, I'll just walk down, and I get down to, about anybody you know, down the bottom of Ballymount Gary Lane, turned on to the, the Ballygoer, and started walking down, and something said to me, again, something said to me, no, turn, turn, and I, 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 I'd usually just walk on, it wouldn't annoy me, so 
I end up at the turn because I kept hearing this turn. It was like somebody telling me to turn. I turned and went back to the bus stop. There was a young man sitting there at the bus stop and sat down with him and waiting on the bus coming. And he says, I, I, was, gonna, I was actually going to contact you last week. I says, what's wrong? He says, no, I haven't been feeling too, haven't been feeling too good and stuff because he knew we had the wee group and stuff. And so anyway, we got on the bus, sit and had a conversation and I invited him down to our group to get some therapies and some support and stuff and things like that there after having the conversation with him. But it was only a year later, uh, he, he got saved uh, on the 3rd of August, uh, 2020, a year later, and when he told his story about getting saved, he talked about the bus stop. He says, it was a guardian angel sent because that day I was getting on the bus to go down to jump in the lagging and take my life. <laughs> I'll probably be here an hour, half an hour. And I was, I was actually worried about filling in 20 minutes. Sorry, I've actually three pages. But we might have to do a part two of this. Uh, so... I just missed a couple of wee bits out there. I got this bit here. We started doing this here during lockdown. I started lockdown in March. Pigeon came up with the idea because we were getting a bit of stick on Facebook with Kenny McCulloch about, kept, he put our two faces in these two ladies with a wee scarves on and he was calling us two fat ladies. So obviously, you know, over lockdown, all these bingo things started coming up. Everybody was playing bingo. So Pigeon came up with the idea, we'll do two fat lads, 88. <laughs> so we're doing this for Northern Ireland Children's Hospice, and so we're going to walk 100 miles in the month, of, I think it was June. Uh, but during these walks, we were doing like three miles a day. Boneyard not there, been out walking, and... We bumped into them a few times while we were out in our walks then. We all started walking together. And one time, Boonyard, as he said earlier on, he invited me down to church. He says, why don't the two of you come down to church? Because every time we're walking around, Pidgeon was always asking him questions about the Bible, trying to catch him out. <laughs> and so he invited me down, and uh, I, I came down to the church, uh, First, first time actually been in the church. It went to loads of man up nights and stuff over in Living Hope and fantastic nights run by the likes of Linegar and we Jim Weir and that there. Some brilliant nights. I actually went down to a couple of their wee prayer meetings they've done for like community and stuff. But I came, I came in that day and uh, I sat down through the service and stuff and, and the worship and uh, I actually really enjoyed it. Really, really enjoyed it. And I went away actually feeling good about myself. So I went up to the house. Joanne says, well, what, what did you think? says, no, I really enjoyed it. I'm, I'm actually going to go next week again. So I went next week. It was the third week. The third week when, uh, uh, obviously, the pastor was preaching and he was giving the word. And he, st st what a, he was talking about this unconditional love uh, God was offering us unconditional love for anyone that wanted a personal relationship. Uh, people are separated from God because of what we do or what we do wrong. But there's good news. Jesus paid the price for our sins. Because of what Jesus did, we can have a relationship with God and experience his unconditional love. And I was thinking to myself, 
this is, this is what I need. This is exactly what I need. Uh, this is what I've been looking for, searching for. Because it, it, when I look back, every time the like someone chewy and stuff was saved and all, and I was going, what is, what is this here? What, why, what brings these people to God? And Linegar, all once seen friends and stuff getting saved, but I just never had felt it or experienced it. But that day I did. And at the end of the services I did the previous weeks, I asked to pray this simple prayer. God, be in my life. Forgive me of my sins and help me to have a life you promised. 